Welcome to our episode of Biblical Archaeology, From the Ground Down. Presented by Bible Interact and hosted by Dr. George Sparks. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of the Bible from leading experts in the field of archaeology. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Graves, an experienced Biblical archaeologist and CEO of Electronic Christian Media. I'm here today with another exciting episode on our Archaeology Discoveries channel, where we discuss important archaeological artifacts related to the Bible. Thanks for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. Welcome, people. My name is Dr. George Sparks. I have my special guest, Dr. David Graves, PhD. Today's topic will be dismantling pseudo-archaeology. It sounds really interesting, so stay with us. Don't run away. Dr. Graves is a PhD from the University of Aberdeen, has been involved in teaching the Bible and archaeology for more than 35 years. He has taught at Oxford University, England, Liberty University, School of Divinity, provided tours in the Ashmolean as well as the British Museum, traveled extensively throughout the Middle East, has been involved in the Mount Ararat research. He has excavated at Qumran, the Temple Mount in Shiloh in Israel, as well as Tel El Hammam in Jordan for well over 10 seasons. He has also been involved in excavating the Dead Sea Scroll Caves, and is an author of many books as well as publications. Welcome to the program, Dr. David Graves. Good to be with you, George, as always. Yes. Thank you very much. Did I tell people what we are? Biblical Archaeology from the Ground Down, sponsored by Bible Interact. There, I did it. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. Well, today we're going to look into some very interesting stuff. We hear the words misinformation and uh, those kinds of terms out there all the time now. And uh, we're going to talk about that as it pertains to archaeology, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. And uh, we're going to try and expose uh, some of the frauds and some of the misinformation that's circulating out there. Not to say that we have any kind of corner on the truth, but uh, we need to be uh, wise and uh, keep our eyes and our minds open to uh, what's happening. So let's... Uh, Dig into that, dismantling pseudo-archaeology. I've subtitled it, What is True? We're always trying to figure out what's truth, what's not. Now, a few preconceptions that I want to point out is I accept the biblical text as historically and theologically accurate. So that's my take and my view on it. And I'm an academic with over 15 years of on-site field archaeological experience in uh, Israel, Jordan, and around the world. So I'm coming at this from someone who understands archaeology and someone who accepts the biblical text. So as an evangelical Christian, I'm an experienced Christian field archaeologist. And I'm not here to slam other Christians, but uh, we just need to understand some of the facts. So how do we define pseudo-archaeology? Pseudo was the word for false. And archaeology, we know what that means. So it's false archaeology. The interpretation of the past from outside of the scientific method of archaeology. So they either ignore or reject outright the accepted excavation and analytical methods and scientific use of, uh, of archaeology. They make a lot of fake claims. These two scientific interpretations involve artifacts and sites or material to construct scientifically insubstantial theories to supplement the pseudo-archaeologist's claim. So they mess around with the facts, is basically what I'm saying. They use methods that include um, such things as exaggeration of evidence, so they exaggerate it sometimes, they make it dramatic or romanticized conclusions, the use of fallacy and fabrication of evidence. They just make stuff up sometimes. And there are a number of Christian pseudo-archaeologists, and actually one there that's not a Christian. Uh, Ron Wyatt, he was an adventurer. We're going to talk about him for a moment. And uh, Bob Corn Cornuke, he's a police officer, retired police officer. 
to get into finding stuff. And then Simcha Jakovici, she, he is a, uh, a Canadian journalist. He's not a Christian, he's Jewish. He's famous program, The Naked Archaeologist. Those well, are just a few of them that I'm going to mention specifically by name. Uh, Ron Wyatt uh, is now deceased, was a journalist for many years, and he's actually probably one of the premier individuals. He's now deceased. He died in 1999. There's his wife and uh, Mary that uh, now runs his organization. A lot of people follow them. A lot of, uh, I would say, uninformed Christians that just take his statements and his ideas uh, and accept them as face value. Here's a few lists of his claims that he has made uh, over the years. Uh, Noah's Ark, that's been debunked by answers in Genesis. And then we have the location of Sodom and Gomorrah debunked. Uh, we have the real Mount Sinai, Jebel Al Laws, also proposed by Bob Cornuke. Uh, Hoffmeyer has critiqued that in his book, page 133. Uh, chariot wheels of the Exodus. And on the right side is a photograph um, of a coral formation and he believes that that is some of the chariot wheels from the chariots that uh, the Pharaoh of the Exodus chased the Israelites out of Egypt, uh, was swallowed up in, in the Reed Sea. Uh, this is one of them. He, he claims he's, they have just imposed the chariot wheels over top of the formation to show what it possibly looks like. But uh, that has not been archaeologically excavated nor confirmed at all. At all. Uh, it's just a a reef where you have a uh, a formation that looks like a chariot wheel. So you have to use your imagination actually to find that, not science or archaeology. Uh, then he's claimed that he's found the Ark of the Covenant in a tunnel under the Temple of Solomon. Uh, again, there's no evidence to submit submitted to support that. It's just a claim. In the site of Christ's crucifixion, he claims he's found as well. So again, just a lot of claims but no evidence. And then there's many others that he's proposed. Well, these are just probably some of the, a few of them. Uh, one of them that I have been sort of involved with has been uh, Mount Ararat, Noah's Ark. This is the Drupaner site in Turkey that he claims is Noah's Ark. Uh, I've been there and taken samples and it's nothing more than an, a geographic formation of the glacier melting every year and running down around it and creating this shape. It, it changes from year to year. There I am. So it's merely a geological formation. That's my photograph of it. The year that I was there, you can see how it's changed its shape just to run off from the glacier. But it's a good spot for tourism. And he's convinced the Turkish government to put up a sign. And they have a little visitor center, Noah's Ark National Park, around the Drupaner site. That's good for tourism. For an in-depth critique of Wyatt's claims, you can see uh, he's, he's a Seventh-day Adventist, and uh, one of the members of the Seventh-day Adventist, his own denomination, has written a, a book against his views, Dr. Colin Standish. Uh, that's the book there if you wanted to check that out, Holy Relics or Revelation. Also, another one is um, Bernard Branster, Branstadter, uh, who worked with him, critiques some of his material on this as well. And then I've got a blog post, if you want to follow that blog site right there. I have a sort of an in-depth critique of his works. But you hear Ron Watt's name come up all the time if you're on the internet or on Facebook groups that talk about archaeology. So we just need to be aware of this, that it's uh, what we would consider pseudo-archaeology. The next folk fellow I'm going to talk about um, is actually uh, Bob Cornuk. This gentleman here is um, Rex Geisler, and Rex and I actually climbed into the Ahura Gorge of Mount Ararat and around the uh, Drupanar site together. But we have, a, we have a conference in 2005 where all the different views of, the, uh, of Noah's Ark came together, Bill Krauss and a bunch of other folks that we, are, we all know. But Bob Cornuke was there. Uh, Bob Stuplich is another one, as I had mentioned, and Rex and Ed Hollerud and Bill Krauss and Alex Alfred Lee and uh, Mary Irwin, the uh, wife of James Irwin, who climbed Mount Ararat as well. 
And uh, his site that he proposes is not the uh, Mount Ararat in Turkey, but rather a, a place called uh, Mount Suleiman, the throne of Solomon, 55 miles northwest of Tehran. And as I said, he's a retired police officer, and that's what he believes it is. And he thinks that this is actually petrified wood, but it's not. It's a, it's a special uh, geological formation of, of rock that, that naturally forms. So a geologist at the University College in London who specializes in sedimentary rock, doesn't think that the arc like rock is petrified wood. He's not an archeologist, but as I said, a retired police officer uh, refused to work together with archeological authorities to le legally conduct research. So he's refused that. He takes no professional field archeologists with him. He collects samples in a non-scientific manner. So they become contaminated, produces no scientific or archeological evidence or reports. So again, we just have to take this word, his word for it and um, supposed to believe him. Um, and this does a dis disservice to us who are uh, professional scientific archeologists and Christians uh, for our work. He retreats when questions question honestly and legitimately doesn't want to answer some of them as well. Now, another one that we need to point out is the Chinese or yeah, the Chinese have uh, created an organization called NAMI, Noah's Ark Ministries International. They've reported to have found and filmed the inside of Noah's Ark, but it's been proven to be a fraud. They staged it and created this uh, stage for the film and the movie. There's a few of the individuals uh, from Hong Kong who were uh, involved in this ministry. The fellow on the top of the mustache is Parachute. We know him from Turkey, uh, the fundraiser. But also one of the members is uh, Randall Price. I taught with Randall at the Liberty University. Uh, he and I were uh, headed up the archeology span program there. He was the um, he was in residence. And I was uh, in charge of the online program. And uh, Don Patton is a geologist as well. So both of them were involved initially with this uh, Chinese uh, group from Hong Kong. But the, um, they claimed they found all this, this wood and the filmmaker Wing Chung had filmed it. But where was the picture taken is the question. It wasn't taken on Mount Ararat as there is no cave with wood inside on Mount Ararat. Uh, Randall has actually climbed Mount Ararat, but uh, he says, I was the archeologist with the Chinese expedition in the summer of 2008. and was given photos of what they now are reporting to be the inside of the ark. I have the photos of the inside of the so-called ark that shows cobwebs in the corner of the rafters, something just not possible in these conditions in our Kurdish partner in Dugas Bayazat, that's the village at the foot of Mount Ararat, has all of the facts about the location, the men who planted the wood, and even the truck that transported it. To my knowledge, the Chinese took no professional archeologist or geologist who would verify or document the wood or the structures in situ, that is in location in the place of its discovery. And that's the place where it was filmed actually, a hot spring near Dayasdin. It's about 50 kilometers west of Mount Ararat. So that's where they set up this cave, filmed it, claiming that it was Noah's Ark. So again, just a fraud, um, but a lot of people believed it. Oh, they found Noah's Ark, everybody claimed. And here we find it's a complete fraudulent reports claiming discovery in 2007. Um, I climbed and visited the area in 2006, the year before that. And then uh, Don Patton has a video exposing the NAMI fraud in September of 2010. Failure, failure to disclose the conclusions of a report by a so-called American geologist who analyzed the wood samples in 2008. They failed to refuse to disclose it. Interna intentional deception by parachute, the Turkish guy, by obtaining funds from the NAMI American expedition. 
parachute false claim to the discovery of Noah's Ark in 2008. Uh, the testimony by Kurdish workers with private knowledge of the construction of that uh, cave, site in the cave, uh, independent investigation of the site, and analysis of wood sample collected by, by Don Patton showed it was not, uh, did not date to that time period. The an analyst of the public NAMI photo by a professional scientist also indicated that it was not true. So that's the NAMI, uh, NAMI scam. Uh, the next person I'm going to mention is the uh, guy by the name of Simcha, Jacob Vichy. Now, we might, uh, he, he has a program on the History Channel or the Discovery Channel or one of those channels called The Naked Archaeologist. You may see a few of the reruns. Um, he's a Canadian journalist, Jewish journalist from the Toronto area. Um, he talks a good talk. Uh, but he's not naked, nor is he an archaeologist. Uh, here are some of the books that he has proposed, uh, has written and published. And James Tabor is actually the uh, co-author of one of them. They found this uh, ossuary with the name of Jesus on it, and they claim that it's the uh, ossuary where the bones of Jesus were placed. And uh, he tries to debunk Christianity, being Jewish, of course. He wants to do that. The Lost Tomb of Jesus, another presentation. And then he's done some work on Atlantis and... Again, uh, the Exodus Code it takes a whole lot of misinformation and uh, some things true, some things false, and tries to weave them together uh, and making a, a, a story. This is, was viewed on the History Channel. Uh, I've seen that one as well. And again, just a lot of misinformation. The next fellow I want to talk about is Joel Kramer and the Sulphur Balls. Now, George will like this one because... Uh, that's one of his pet peeves is the sulfur balls theory. Uh, this one associates with Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, his channel is the Expedition Bible. This is the uh, background for Joel Kramer. He is an archaeologist. He's got an MA in archaeology from the University of the Holy Land. Um, he's worked with Sh Shimon Gibson, who I know. Uh, he worked in a lot of famous places, Jerusalem, Bethel, and I, and he teaches it to adjunct professor at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. So he's got a he's got an archaeological background. Now some of the things that uh, Joel and I have in common is that we are both Christian archaeologists. We both believe the biblical account is historically true. So we're both maximalists. We both worked at Kirbin El Makater, what we believe to be I. And we are both on the staff of the Associates for Biblical Research with uh, many common friends on staff. Uh, we both know Dr. Bryant Wood of the Associates for Biblical Research. We both published in the Bible in Spade magazine. And we've worked in archaeology in Jordan. And we both know, as I said, Dr. Shimon Gibson. We both have taken Christians on tours of Israel and Jordan. And we share a passion for good graphics because he likes he put, he's got some good graphics. And he's done these films on Sodom, and he believes it's in a different location than I do. But what he misrepresents is this, this uh, idea and theory of sulfur balls connected with Sodom and Gomorrah, encased in gypsum, formed naturally along the Dead Sea shores. So all around the Dead Sea shores, you find these sulfur balls. It's been, and they have many uses, among which is setting fires. And here he, uh, he demonstrates how one of these sulfur balls can be uh, lit on fire. That's true. And here he's holding six of them in his hand. That is true. The problem is, is that he makes a, an argument that because he found some sulfur balls around the Dead Sea, he then jumps to the conclusion that to Baba Draw and Numira are Sodom and Gomorrah in the south end of the Dead Sea. Well, sulfur balls are also found up around the uh, the north side of the Dead Sea as well, um, as is uh, depicted in the um, the museum, formed naturally along the Dead Sea shores. 
And when I was there, I witnessed seeing them around the Dead Sea as well. But not just in that one place called Babadra or not just in the one place called Numira. If a city around the Dead Sea, and I believe Tel Hamam is Sodom, in the north end of the Dead Sea, if an air burst came in and we had this explosion in the atmosphere, no doubt these would have helped with the fire. But it doesn't prove that Babadra is Sodom. All it indicates is the region around the Dead Sea is perfectly suited for a good fire. We also have petroleum products, uh, bitumen, uh, tar, uh, that floats up in the Dead Sea as well. So the whole region around the Dead Sea, so there's not any one particular spot that you can say, well, just because we find a sulfur ball somewhere, that it's Sodom, because they're all over the place. Now, George, um, I finished up with my presentation. If you want to uh, chime in here, because I know this is one of the things that irritates you about the sulfur balls. <laughs> Could you bring it back two, three slides? You know what that looks like to me? Looks like they're on a campfire. I'm just teasing, right? Come on, folks. It looks like a marshmallow. I look yeah. at that, I get hungry. I think <laughs> about s'mores. I mean, when's the last time you would have s'mores at Sodom and Gomorrah? I mean, come on. That's that's awesome. You know, <laughs> yeah. you're at Sodom and Gomorrah. This place, Numera and Baba Dra. All right. Once again, where he's at is on the east side of the Dead Sea called Numera and Baba Dra. If he's talking yeah. about the tombs, he's probably at a location called Bob Idra. You can look it up. And there's going to be good information. There's going to be information. There's going to be good information. What are the archaeologists? Is it uh, Schwab or something like that she dug out there or he dug out there? Yeah, Rast and Schwab. Yes. And I'll tell you what, the, report, the reports on these locations are like a thousand pages. And yeah. let's see, I got... I got one book. It was like 30 books, $30. And there's another book that just talks about the discovery of the within the tombs because they got shaft tombs and they got uh, cardinal house tombs. Yeah. And the thing is, is that that book is 300 bucks and, yeah. and I couldn't deal with it at the moment, but I'd love to get it. And when I do, I'd like to share it with everybody because this uh, is published and written by good archaeologists, really good archaeologists. Yeah. Um, George, I didn't put up my books today, but uh, my book on the location of Sodom, if you look uh -huh. at any of the podcasts we've done, it'll be listed there. Uh, I have all of the footnotes and all of the um, the research by Rast and Schwab, who dug at uh, Baba Dra and Numera. This, this is New Testament. Not yeah, there's information on it in that one as well, but um, extensive work done in the location of Sodom. This location right here will jo where, where Joel is um, showing the uh, the burning of one of these sulfur balls is actually Numira. This is not Babadra. Numira is just north of Babadra by, oh, I don't know, a 10-minute drive or something, a five-minute drive. It's not very far away. And there's a little, little settlement there. Uh, but it's not the only place where these sulfur balls are, lo are, are discovered or, or found. They're found, as, as is, is mentioned by that, display in the museum all around the Dead Sea. Let me ask you something. Well, I, I've asked you this before, but just because you're on this topic. Now, my wife, Sharisa, was at Bob. I think she went to Baba Dra and Numera. I don't know if she went to Num both at the same time. You've been there. Yes, with your wife. Okay. With, with, what? with my wife, what? <laughs> well, there was a bus, a bus load of us, I should clarify. <laughs> At the and same uh, time, yeah. <laughs> well, you're going to the right place because what happens in Sodom, I'm not going to say. <laughs> but did you guys find sulfur balls when you were there? I didn't find any personally at uh, okay, there we Baba go. Draw yeah. that day that I was there, but I have seen them uh, traveling all around the Dead Sea because we drive up and down, and I've been on both sides of the of the Dead Sea, uh, uh -huh. all around in Getty, all the way down to. Uh, Masada uh, to Mount Sodom uh, on the Israeli side, and then of course all the way from Tel Aviv, um, all the way down past Makaris. We talked about that last week. 
um, all the way down to Baba Dra and Numira. And I've been there several times. So again, I don't remember. Therese told me she didn't see any of those. She was looking for them because remember, I had a friend of mine who was a, a medical doctor who traveled with Ron Wyatt, and he had a suitcase full of soffer balls. But he picked yeah. them up in the location very close to Masada, which would be on the west side. That's right. right? And Dr. Randall Price, another acquaintance of yours, fellow professor at Liberty University. Yeah. And I asked him not to bring the sulfur balls and show them to Randall Price because that's not the lecture tonight. And sure enough, he did. <laughs> Medical doctors, what can you do? You know, they want us to listen to them, but will they listen to us? <laughs> so, yeah. but, uh, so anyway uh, you know the few people that I know that I've talked to that been to these locations of Numer and Baba Dra told me they didn't notice or pick up you know any sulfur balls because when you see this stuff on TV it's like they're just pulling them out of the ground right they're just pop pulling them out which I guess if you're on the west side and it is part of a a ge uh, geological foundation, ge geological cause of the Dead Sea reside, you know, like, we could say, I'm going to say it's shrinking. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 okay, once maybe the Dead Sea was big enough where it covered this area, but it's part of the land features, as you just mentioned. Yeah. And and, you and it's odd. I, I, I didn't know you were going to bring this guy up because yeah. I do like a lot of the stuff, but some of it I, I don't like. Yeah. I don't like oh. it because I think it's sensational in some ways, and it wasn't accurate archaeology, which he's in Israel, and he's got a degree, a master's in archaeology. Should No, I think you know better yeah. myself. Well, like I said, you know, we share a lot of the same things in common, but I wanted to end with, uh, with Joel because there's a full spectrum with pseudo-archaeology. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes it's been creeping in and affecting even legitimate archaeologists such as ourselves. And he wants to actually argue for uh, Baba Dra and Numera as the uh, location for Sodom. So um, when he when he shows this video, there's, he's got a video out on this. I, this is one of the photos from that video. Uh, he mm -hmm. shows picking them out of the wall, uh, the surface on the on the west side there you go Israel. see and he picks them up and then he he shows numera that he's at burning them here at numera and i suspect he didn't find them at numera i suspect he found them on the west side and brought them over and lit them up here because he wants to make a case for um so he's just being deceptive in this case um, or sensational. So we just need to realize the full spectrum of this uh, pseudo-archaeology and a, a lot of misinformation that the average person doesn't uh, doesn't know. But even if there is sulfur balls here, it doesn't mean, because we find sulfur balls on the other side of the uh, Jordan River. Mm -hmm. So which one is Sodom then? Because they both have sulfur the balls. With the, the one with the sulfur balls. <laughs> exactly. So you know the uh, thing is, is well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sulfur balls is just part of the whole region. It's full of petroleum. In fact, at our site at Tel Hamam, there's a hot spring there, um, and during the day you can smell the sulfur from the hot springs. That's true. That is true. It is true. It stinks. Yeah. Yeah. So it the whole region around the Dead Sea, and then and of course the museum. The museum, as I showed the picture of the, here it is. This is a photo uh, probably in the, uh, I think this is taken at the museum at the lowest point on earth, it's called, just below Lot's Cave, which is just north of this site. And they have the sulfur balls there. Encased in gypsum, formed naturally along the Dead Sea shores. So, Again, they're saying that this is formed all around the shores of the Dead Sea. And that's, that's a museum the, in Jordan. That's yeah. the museum in Jordan, not far right. from this place. So they're they know where this, this stuff has come from. Right. Yeah, ab <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah. So, so again, anyway. he's just making he's making a lot 
about nothing is really what he's doing. That's here. very true. But okay, I got hit with this because we did a program already on. I don't think we talked about this gentleman. We just made the case about Numera Babadra. And uh, I got hit with the question. It was like three days ago, and I answered it. And then somehow it got deleted from that podcast. And so I said, I did text you back with an answer because it said, give me one answer why you don't agree. And I said, okay. And I, I listed five. And I and the thing is, is my first listing, which it took me a while to do this, folks. And then as it got deleted. I said, okay, I'm going to do one more time. Hopefully you see it. And I sent him that ahead of time. I just said, I did send it to you. I don't know what happened. I'll do it one more time. But if it isn't there, then whatever. So the first one is, I, what was it? Oh, Boxwell Albright. Back at, I, And I said 1930. And, and folks, I was wrong with that. It wasn't 1930. It was 1924, two years after the discovery of King Tut's tomb. And two years after the discovery of dinosaur eggs by Roy Chapman Andrews, just in case people didn't know that. In 1924, Oxwell Albright discovered the location of Numera Baba Dra. And what did he say? He said the pottery typology is way too old. Back in the 1920s, I said 1930s, I was wrong by a, a decade, but the statement was still the same by the same individual, point number one. Since the 1920s, we knew the pottery was too old for Abraham because Abraham yes. and Lot would have to visit it. Next point. Is that Albright, the city's? George, go ahead. Before you go yes. on, on that point, Albright said that the uh, dating of all the pottery of Babadra and Numira were early bronze. And he said it's too early for Abraham. And right. he speculated at that point that Sodom and Gomorrah were under the Dead Sea. And that was the view held for many, many years until we excavated Tel Al Hamam. Uh -huh. Found the evidence. I think they the actually did. Somebody took a submarine down there to take a look, too. Yeah, the Russians did as well and didn't find uh, any uh, any Sodom or Gomorrah. So continue. I with thought, you. Yeah, well, I thought it was the Beatles because they had a yellow submarine. So I thought maybe the Beatles did that one. No, it was a Russian. Okay. But anyway, point number two was, is that between the two cities in that area, Numera and Baba Dra, there's a destruction, conflagration, if we want to be archaeologists, conflagration, destruction of a difference of over 250 years, which in the biblical narrative, they got to be destroyed at the same time. The cities of the plain were destroyed at one event at the same time. These two cities were destroyed 250 years apart, and point those, number two. And those archaeological uh, uh, reports are documented mm -hmm. in my book. Let's see. That's only number two. For, I think that's almost good enough. But I, I did mention the sulfur balls that we already did. I said, is he showing you sulfur balls that, from what I understand, I've never been there? But the people that I know have been there, all of them had said, we didn't see no sulfur balls there. By Masada on the west side, yes. In this location, no. Okay. And so, other, uh, George, go ahead. The other mm -hmm. fact I don't think people realize is that uh, Babadra and Numira are, are up on the uh, at a very high altitude, yes. looking overlooking the Dead Sea. So it's not right on the shore. Uh, it's around the shore of the Dead Sea that you find the sulfur balls. This idea of the sulfur balls was introduced originally by Ron Wyatt. And so You're he's probably right. that, that idea. And Joel has picked that idea up from, from Ron Wyatt and introducing it in, trying to make it sensational for his film. Go continue on. Why would, I, why would somebody with a degree in archaeology use one Ron Wyatt? <laughs> yeah, that's the only... It's the only evidence they have to try and convince people that it's in the south end of the dead sea well just a, it's not very good evidence because right there you know we there's two good reasons right there now another one we kind of mentioned but you gave mentioned for this one is that the charnel houses which are in the baba dra area they look like of course they do look like houses and it yep. says well 
why were all why was the cemetery burned because it was a conflagration that came to from the sky and it came down as non-discriminate so it burnt the city and the tombs you know what i went back and read some reports like i said i got a book i didn't get the one that i wanted that would be solely on the artifacts coming from the tombs that's the one i wanted and it, it said something that i didn't really know that in the excavation uh, they only excavated four charnel houses. Yes. Of of the four, two were burned. Two. Not necessarily the whole cemetery. I always thought it was the whole cemetery got burned. But in the book, it just said two. Mm -hmm. Oddly. Okay. But all right. And, fine. And I make a point also that Dr. Bryant Wood has made the argument that this is proof that it was destroyed by God from the sky, right. uh, raining down fire. Now, I make the point that at the British Museum, when you look at the Lakish reliefs uh, in the British Museum, you see them uh, shooting, they call them rockets, or flaming arrows by the enemy. And we know that Kedi Laomer, the Assyrians, had come down and battled the cities of the plain, and um, it would not be uncommon for them to shoot fiery arrows under the roof of things that looked like houses to burn them. And to the Assyrians, those graves would have certainly looked like homes. Now, now, now I, I, I don't have sulfur balls, but, you know, from a distance, people wouldn't know the difference. I thought I'd get some powdered donuts for today and then kind of like stack them <laughs> up, you know. I try to light one, but they probably wouldn't light. Maybe they would. I don't know. It is sugar. I'd like one. Ooh. But if it did night, I said, this is one of those sulfur duds. You know, that's because if they fall from the sky and they're burning and they hit the ground, they probably just go, you know, but if they're stuck in the soil, those must be the duds that didn't, you know, for some reason, those didn't work right. Just another thought. Come on. Why not? I know we're laughing at the same time. People, we're going to hear about this. And that's fair, people. If you don't, you don't uh, agree, that's, uh, I understand. Believe me, like I said, I had a medical doctor friend of mine, emergency room doctor. He's got a whole suitcase of sulfur balls and he's still my friend. And you can be my friend too, even if you got a suitcase full of sulfur balls and you let me know how much you, you like or dislike it. I, that's fine, folks. I don't care. And, well, but just, just to know that I, I just disagree with, I disagree with it in behalf that I really don't think somebody that's got to the level of a PhD in archeology span and has his experience can turn around and say this. Yeah. Especially my, when it's so readable. And my point. Go ahead. My point today is that we need to be discerning as Christians with the information that is being made available to us, that we need to use our discretion, even from Christian archaeologists, even me. You know, I provide the footnotes, I bring the receipts, uh, but you need to check them out. You can't just accept what people say. Uh, as the gospel truth, and uh, even though Joel um, has picked up some of this misinformation and started to use it in a in a professional sense, uh, with people that have entrusted themselves that he might know what's going on, and he, he's an archaeologist and it's true, we need to be cautious about what's being um, put up on the internet. Check out their sources. Uh, look at the scientific evidence. Uh, I work on evidence-based archaeology, and that's why I think this uh, podcast is so important for uh, the average individual out there. As I put it, as a subtitle, what is true? Who can you trust? And um, there are some you can trust, and there's others you can't. And so I put up a, yeah. a spectrum of some that you uh, shouldn't trust at all, and um, and what they also do is sometimes I put in a little bit of truth in there once in a while. You can't, oh, heck you, yeah. Not yeah you, you just can't accept if they have a if they have one little nugget of truth and they throw in some of this uh, pseudoscience uh, right beside it, like Joel has done. Um, just be cautious. You can't just, you can't be gullible. That's another one he did that kind of like I had to make a comment on. And then somebody says, well, make a point. And he was at the Israel Museum, and they were like bronze arrowheads. They said bronze. It could be a – it was early. It could was very, very early bronze. It, should, it could be copper. And they were large like this. They were very large. They were. 
And I said, you know what? You're if I was at the Israel Museum doing my Bible archaeology from the ground down. If I was at the Israel Museum, you know what I do? First of all, I would get me one of the curators that are in charge of that section of the museum, and I would invite them to be on the program. I said, you know what? See if I can get the funds. I said, I got this much of money, about of money. Would you come and explain this showcase for us? And maybe even pull out a couple items and bring them up nice and close. The second thing is that all those artifacts had an attribution right next to them. And you had a camera that could zero in on those so that we could read them and we could read along with you. Why didn't you do that? Instead, he's telling us that these were the arrows that the giants threw back in the day when it talks about the Nephilim. Everything's Nephilim. I thought, I can't believe he, I just heard that. I said, I just can't believe he said these belong to the Nephilim. There was other artifacts on the bottom of the shelf. And, uh, and um, so I looked them up. How hard is it, people? You just look stuff up. It gave it a date, around 2700 BC. He said this went back five, 6,000 years, something crazy. And these were used by giants. I'm thinking like, man, zoom on those attributions next to them. Let me read those for myself. You know, they'll probably be in Hebrew and they'll probably be in English. And why make it hard on yourself? Get an archaeologist out there. Who are you? I'm Dr. So-and-so, PhD. Bring them on. Male, female, doesn't matter, Right. Let them explain. Is their museum? What's going on? Why not? And I, but you know, all you had to do is Google it, and it told you all about these where they were found. And they do analysis on the type of metals and tell you where the metals would have came from. They look at the style of the weapons and say who are making those style of weapons, and where they might have come. They said some of them might have came out of Egypt, and it was just way way off. And I said if I was at that display reading that attributions by those that are credited to make those kind of statements for the millions of people to go see that display right how could i stand there and tell people that that bothers me okay that a bothers little, me a little trick for folks when you're visiting a museum what i what i've done over the years uh, i would take a photograph of the artifact and then i would take a photograph of the attribution right. and then when right. i get home i would know the photograph is first attribution is second and then i would know exactly what it was and if i want to do further research i mean and even that you have to be careful because sometimes they have those things mislabeled mm -hmm. um i've seen that happen at the, the university of cairo when we were there they had things that were labeled uh middle bronze that were clearly early bronze uh, but they were just ha sort of handwritten on a piece of paper the new okay, museum yeah. is much better uh the same thing in jordan uh, the new the new museum's got things better uh, better displays more up to date, uh, so you can't always accept those. But again, as you say, uh, start there, uh, get what the ex experts are claiming at the time. They know where it was found. Uh, they know the archaeologists probably found it, uh, where it's come from. They know it's uh, it's provenance. So uh, yeah, do your homework and uh, don't just and make you, stuff and you up. Said yeah, and you said something that's true too, because of course, in the article that I read, you know, regarding these artifacts in the showcase, some of what he said did match. I caught the Oreo effect. There's going to be truth, then there's going to be pseudo stuff, and then there's going to be truth. It's kind of like the Oreo stuff. It becomes sensationalism, and uh, it, it, well, that's what it was. And another thing is that you mentioned you take a picture of the artifact and you take a picture of the attribution. That works well if you ever go to an excavation, a dig. And when you go to Israel and you're going on a tour and you're taking, now we got digital cameras, so you can take tens of thousands of photos. And you're taking pictures of all these stacks of rocks. And when you get home, you just lose it. So when you go to a place, you take a picture of the place. And then you take a picture of the archaeological excavation. And then you take a picture of the sign that tells you what you're looking at. So it stays in an order. So when you get back home, you know exactly what you did. Because if you don't, that stack of rocks are going to start to all look alike. And you're going you know, to probably lose some of what you'll lose the meaning uh, of what all that work that you put into it. So that was a good point, David, to take yeah. a picture of the artifact and then the sign. Or if you're at a dig, take a picture of what you're looking at at the excavation and then the sign to explain it to you. 
Um, you want to move on to somebody else? Bob Carnuke. He was one of that gang that actually said they rediscovered the location of the Temple Mount. The Temple yes. Not Mount. Yeah. The Un-Temple Mount. Who does the... Uh, it's the Un-Birthday, like uh, Alice in Wonderland, but this is the Un-Birthday. This is the Un-Temple Mount. I right. got to laugh because there's so much evidence. And uh, and a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Bo Relation, Dr. Bobby Sparks, he's got a little booklet. I'm going to find that little sucker booklet. It's around here somewhere. I just had it. And he wrote a, a booklet on said where, where it is not. And he describes all this stuff. Yeah, and my, it's not that big. I do recommend it. It's, it's a little yeah, tiny my good book. friend, my good friend, Dr. Uh, Scott Stripling has just published uh, an article on that. I think it was put out in the Near East Archaeological Society bulletin, I think. I did some of the drawings for it. Yeah, he's um, refuted the revisionist views of Bob Cornuk and others. Uh, what happens is that one one guy writes something or says something, and then somebody else picks it up and uses it. And I mean, you'll even find the same stuff from Ron Wyatt in uh, Shim, Simcha's uh, podcast and and uh, articles. And again, I'm some... to read, looking for that book. I I, I had it here. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, don't say it's old. Don't say it's like Alzheimer's. Except I got a stack of books back here, folks. And it's a little thin book like that. Well, you also but have, listen. You also have family around, so uh, yeah, that can happen. Um, but let's say around the Temple Mount, you got so much stuff, you know. And they say, well, Jesus said there will be not one stone left upon another. So if there's stones left upon another, then it can't be the Temple Mount. That's the place of the Roman encampment. And they came up with something like that. Um, but you got Robinson's Arch. You got the rabbinical teaching staircase you got the double gate the triple gate that's all on the south side and if you want <laughs> someone who does a really good job oh. with the temple mount dr lane rittmeyer is yeah. the uh, leading world's leading expert on the temple mount uh, an archaeological architect uh, he's dug with us or worked with us at uh, hamam and shiloh and kirbid el makadar and with all, all the famous uh, israeli archaeologists going way back years and years and years. He lived in Israel. Uh, so and he's written a couple of books I would highly recommend. Um, one's called The Quest. Um, and it's, uh, he's really the authority on the Temple Mount and he places it where it uh, is today. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's based on the archeology span evidence um, and as an architect. So he knows what he's talking about. And so I wish I would, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert pictures after you know, when we get this edited, and I'll put the pictures in for you folks. I have the quest here. It's about yay thick. It's a thick book. It's not just the Herodian temple. It also goes back to the uh, time period of Solomon. And we'll, uh, and we'll those... pointing out the uh, northern and southern locations and where they are as well. I forgot to do yeah. that in my PowerPoint. What? You have to redo your PowerPoint now. We're going to have to come back, that. folks, later. <laughs> Okay, that's Bob Carnook. He's done a lot. He's been out there looking for the Ark and all that. Let's see. Maybe he's also done uh, Noah's Ark, so the Ark of the Covenant and Noah's Ark. I've seen this kind of stuff on, like, the History Channel. What the History Channel is digging for truth or something like that. You know, I I kind of like these programs. I do. I, I watch them. Folks, I watch it. doesn't mean I believe it. I kind of like to see the places where they go. It kind of... When, when a pseudo archaeology, I can kind of consider it like ghost hunting. You go like the, like, I'm going to change the subject, but really, you, these people go to really cool places. Now, I could care less what they say they're looking for, you know, if they're looking for a specter or something, but they're going to like the Monticello, Jefferson's house, right? Mount Vernon. They just go to really cool places. I said, you know, that's fun. They go to lighthouses. Well, anyway. Uh, same thing with Bob Carnuke and some of these. They, they go to some cool, cool places, but doesn't mean I believe it. Who's your other buddy from Canada? Terrible getting old. I know exactly. Who yeah, that's the naked about. archaeologist guy. He's the producer. Sim, Sim He's got great graphics, man. His shows have great graphics, man. Yeah. I, uh, Simcha. I mean, uh, Simcha, yeah. And uh, he did that one decoding the Exodus, the, Exodus. the date of the Exodus. And yeah, he had that thing like the Da Vinci Code that was clicking back and forth. It was really cool graphics. You now, know, what's was, interesting uh, about him is that he takes a lot of stuff that's true, uh -huh. and then he throws in some stuff that's not, 
and then he reworks the timeline so that stuff is not happening at the same time it should happen. Uh, so yeah, he basically yeah. he just he just mixes stuff up. But you're right, he gets everybody with the great graphics, and you think this stuff is wonderful. So I watch these because I want to know you know what's going on. Uh, I used to use that video on decoding the Exodus to have a discussion with our my students. Made them watch it so we could sit down and actually deconstruct the uh, decoding the Exodus. <laughs> yeah, so you're decoding decoding the decoder or something. Yeah, but I always do it. My blood pressure usually That's goes fun. up. <laughs> gets yeah, me you right know. Up. But uh, you got to know what the enemy's saying or, or what the opposite views are because you want to defend them. Did uh, you just call him the enemy? Yeah. Come on, David. <laughs> <laughs> He does well, do some cool stuff, man. He does. The, the, I mean, the places, the graphics. Come on, you gotta like the graphics. Oh, I do. Like you say, I don't have to agree. Yeah, yeah I love the, for real. Love the graphics. But uh, uh, and go ahead. go ahead. You just have to be discerning. Whatever uh, anybody's putting some, something out there, you've got to be discerning. Uh, people need to be discerning with us. Uh, we can make mistakes, and uh, but uh, I don't throw any. Uh, I don't throw any of that nonsense into my. Uh, my books, I'll tell you that. Uh, if I can't find references and and uh, scholarly research for it, uh, I don't publish it. Okay, then uh, sticking with your buddy from Canada. See, we don't got that stuff down here in America. We that must be that stuff up in Canada going on. No. Um, yeah, I know that's bold. Okay. But the uh, um, yeah, the next one was the the Tapia tombs. That was another big one that he did with Doctor James Tabor. And you know what? Here it goes. I. I am frequently on Dr. Tabor's channel because I really en I enjoy what he says. He's a very, very smart scholar. Doesn't mean we agree with everything. And actually, I've actually, uh, been talking to him. We were emailing back and forth a couple of months ago. And uh, anyway, um, the Tapia tombs and where they found a selection of ossuaries. And the ossuaries had similar names to the Holy Family. Yes. And... Uh, and you know, for and this becomes difficult for even a trained archaeologist. Come on, because I can't imagine uh, the laity trying to sort this out. Uh, yeah. But because you got some pretty, I'm not going to say crafty, because maybe somebody genuinely believes. Well, it, it, this particular tomb, which is in a housing complex now, was discovered much much earlier, decades early. So it was rediscovered, and I think what brought it about was uh, the concern of an ossuary. It was the James ossuary. James, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus ossuary. Yes. Yes. And the problem was, was it was the part that says the brother of Jesus at the end, was that part forged much later on? And it went to trial and it kind of got, I'm not going to say it got thrown out, but nobody was found guilty because Nobody had enough evidence to say we don't know if it's authentic or not. So they left and it alone. Of course, the Oshawa is authentic. The other problem with it is that people don't realize in our day, and the average Christian, um, how mm -hmm. popular those names were in the uh, first century. Uh, I think I put up a chart when we did the Oshawaries uh, indicating, you know, that uh, the name of Jesus is used 22 times in Oshawaries. When we see the name Jesus, we just think it must be Jesus of Nazareth. That that one mm -hmm. is very common. And so and James was a very popular name during the first century. So to find those together um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's the Jesus of Nazareth, you know, which Jesus was it? Um, and so they sort of they don't reveal that information um, indicating how popular the name was. So everybody just immediately gravitates to, oh, this must be Jesus of Nazareth. So Ch yeah. Simcha was a little bit deceptive there when he did his, his presentation, um, not giving us all the facts. So sometimes it's by by uh, leaving out the information, neglecting to mention it. Uh, sometimes it's uh, you know, falsification of evidence. Uh, sometimes it's an exaggeration of the evidence, making more of the evidence than is there. I, I point all these fallacies out in my book on the uh, digging up the Bible, the whole section. I think there's 12 or so fallacies that I point out. Um, so we just have to be discerning 
um, do our research. Uh, don't believe everything that you see on the internet, every YouTube video, if you Google for it, all the big popular ones come up. You'll, you'll have Ron Wyatt popping up all the time for whatever reasons. I guess a lot of people are looking at his stuff. But they still uh, believe it. They still believe Ron Wyatt after all these and years. The other thing I the other thing I didn't do is I didn't deal with motives. I, I I'm not I'm not uh saying that they had they have bad motives, these folks. They sincerely believe um what they're putting out there, that they found the stuff. I just believe they're sincerely wrong. I think one would know if they found an Ark or Covenant or not. Either you found it or you didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, come on, really? Yeah. You know what? Well, they said that the Ashway is James, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus. And, they, you know, when they do the ratios, they say, well, the odds of two names, the odds of three names. And they work out the math. And I know you did that in your book and in the podcast as well. Yeah. I'm just thinking, like, what if it said James, the son of Joseph, the brother of Steve? That would pretty much limit it, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know we had a Steve in the Old Testament. Well, Steve is there. But, okay, so we can't, you know, if we take this too seriously, we're people are just going to give us all kinds of hate, man. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about Ryan one more time, and I'm going to come and visit you and shake your tires. Uh, let's talk about Ron Wyatt then. Oh, you know, what? I'm just jealous. I'm not popular. If nobody talks about me. They say, George, who? I feel like an owl when they say, George, they go, who? But uh, well, you know. So you which know, one? George, which one of his discoveries? There, there is a Stephen in Scripture. Stephanos means crown. So, okay. <laughs> Stephanos means crown in Greek. <laughs> we found a few crowns, a few Stephanos. Um, so what? Yeah, you did have a picture of the chariot wheels. The chariot wheels always come up. Oh yeah, and that of course every time I think if they get, what do you want to call it? Somebody that 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 knows coral foundation, coral development formation. They always explain exactly what it is, and they said this is not uncommon. You got to use your imagination. It does look like if you want to chariot wheels, but then they think, well, chariot wheels. How long would wood last in salt water? Right. Yeah. That was another one they found. Oh, of course, the old steer, old chariot wheel. That's the hub. Yeah, you know, yeah. and they, you know, and but the thing, <laughs> yes. And the issue there is how many spokes did the uh, did the Egyptians have in their wheels? Right, right. That's the easy one there. Yeah. So I think they they you look at what they are showing as a photograph. It doesn't match up. There's four or six spokes, and uh, so anyway, uh, that's all been debunked on uh, a lot of. Uh, the Associate yeah. for Biblical Research I have a big page on that, and I've got I've got more references on my my blog post for them. I didn't go through everything because uh, you couldn't I couldn't go through and debunk every single one of their their claims. Well, let me ask you something. Like honestly, folks, honestly, now this is a big looks like a steering wheel, like four spokes, like this, right? Solid gold. Are you going to leave it there or are you going to pick it up? That's pretty tempting. Honestly, come on. I just, uh, it's going to leave it there, you know? I I don't know. That to me feels like a gold, a solid gold, whatever it is. I don't care if it is a chariot wheel. Are they, are they claiming it's solid gold? I didn't read that one. Yeah, they, well, they say gold, but when they say gold, you know, in your mind, you're thinking like it's a big, thick steering wheel looking. If you want to say chariot wheel, fine. But I'm just saying if it's solid gold like that or quasi gold, who in the world is going to leave it there on the bottom of the ocean? Yeah. Especially now, since I, there's been so many videos of it. For our listeners out there, we're not saying that the event didn't happen. What do you mean the event? Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. The exodus. Right. Of the, yeah. The parting of the Red Sea, or the Reed Sea. We're not claiming that that didn't happen, but try to prove it with stuff that isn't true uh, just makes us look like idiots as Christians. And uh, um, bring how the deep evidence. is it there anyway? How how far they have to? How far is that? Because they got 
it's called the Nueva Peninsula, and it's, and then it's got that. They saw us a little land bridge that goes across, and then one side to the other, it really deeps down like a thousand feet. I might be exaggerating, but everybody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah. And uh, I just think, I even though how far, like three hundred feet below, and I just wonder how hard would the wind have to blow to move that much water out of the way? I'm just trying to be realistic, you know, like scientific give me some like some numbers i would just wonder if I had to blow something like three three thousand miles an hour to move that kind of water which would literally take your skin off well the other problem we have with the exodus and the uh, crossing is um, the coastline has changed since antiquity uh, many of the tributaries have dried up you've got the bitter lake um, you've got you've got another lake um, above it called the, um, uh, just evades me. I've been there. Anyway, uh, there was a sea of reeds. There was a lot of reeds in it uh, when we were there. But, you know, the contour of that coast has changed. So we can't just use a modern map and say, oh, this is what it looked like during that time period. Similar to what we find in Ephesus, because it's silted in. It used to be a harbor on the coast, and now it's like two miles inland because the, uh, uh, the harbor is all silted in. They had to completely dredge it every year with uh, in the first century to keep it uh, as a as a harbor so you look at a modern map and it's it's Ephesus way inland the same thing as the coast of Egypt with the Delta region that's all silted in and changed the flow so uh, where was the waters originally in the uh, in the period of the Exodus it's certainly different from where the water is flowing today so we may not even be able to identify it and the other thing is, my other point is that uh, we've got uh, underwater archaeology. So if there is something down there, why aren't they sending divers down and bringing stuff up so that we can analyze it and, and date it? But just mm -hmm. to take a photograph of something that looks like a chariot wheel and claiming that this is where it happened, <laughs> proves the Bible, is just uh, not good science and not good logic. That's been done by multiple people at different times like maybe ron wyatt then a decade later her nuke and then a decade later somebody else and it's just the same theory rehashed except it's a new generation looking at it with better graphics it's yeah. the same old stuff that's been debunked but it still sells millions of stuff millions of books yeah it's um, sensationalism it's sensational i know i know i'm just jealous I'm just jealous. I'm je jealous, old and bald. You know? I'm a grumpy old man. Uh, let's see. What else can we talk about? We got, you, you mentioned like Noah's Ark briefly, but these were how uh, that um, Chinese group tried to, they actually built it in a cave. I remember that going coming out, you know, and you see yeah. these nice, even cut planks like this. And, and you think, uh, you know, how exactly would they cut wood? <laughs> If you want to use the biblical date around 2,400 years ago, and what kind of tools did they have 2,400 years ago without the help, without the help of aliens? Let's let's get for real. And then, uh, well, the Nephilim, right? they lifted them up and put them in place. And, no, uh, those were dinosaurs. We talked funny. about that. <laughs> the dinosaurs came out of Egypt because we saw them on a on a uh, cosmetic palette. Wait a second. Yeah, I would say this that yeah, long. Right there, right? See, see the dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah. And right there, see now. If I was gonna look at like this and then like that, I'd be what part of the woke woke generation. But I can't do that. I'm too old. I don't even have earrings. That would probably be <laughs> the uh, the Chinese, um, the Hong Kong expedition is probably the most uh, deceptive one that I have seen. Um, mm -hmm trying to claim they'd found Noah's Ark. What, so what's the I, most, you say the most deceptive is the degrees of deception? Well, yeah, I would say I could put them on a <laughs> spectrum. So they go all the way from uh, from the NAMI group, in Hong Kong, all the way up to Joel, Joel Kramer, who you know, is an actual archaeologist, uh, just using some popularized stuff. But uh, uh. the majority of the stuff he says is uh, is good, but 
you know, he's he's drifted off into uh, the Ron Wyatt nonsense and to try and support well, okay. his view. So there's a we're going to hear about that. We're going to hear about he's very popular and folks, you know, a lot of that stuff. I, I love the graphics. A lot of the stuff I like. There's a couple on there. I like two, two so far. And there's another one they just did is something like on the rivers mentioned in Genesis, the five rivers that flowed through Eden, something going on there. I've been, I'm have i not a geologist. So that's going to take me to uh, bring a geologist on the program with a degree to really figure that one out. But I will, I will get one because I just had our first Egyptologist on two weeks ago. So, you know what you say is you take it directly to the source, right? Well, it's, and we don't have to agree with everybody that we listen to, but uh, you can weigh the evidence. What's another one I heard talking about pseudo-archaeology is, I don't know where they get their degrees, but they're supposed to be PhD pa paleontologists that talk about soft tissue, soft tissue and dinosaur bones that proves that they're only five thousand years old the earth can't be really old and actually that discovery was by a lady when she was still at her master's degree level now she's phd the name has escaped me because david has distracted me not because i'm old but uh and i'm gonna i i, I emailed her i'm gonna get her on the program i read some of her articles and how she felt about this they get this soft tissue and some of them are actually stretching soft tissue like it's a piece of skin off a tucky fried chicken. I'm thinking they're doing like this. Oh, come on. That didn't come off no dinosaur. That's ridiculous. It's just like the sulfur balls, right? They're talking about this and then they get something and they put it in that place to actually make it seem like it's from that location. And here they got something going that's got nothing to do with the dinosaur bones, which are actually petrified. Petrified. Now, there's some that would say they use Mount St. Helens and they say, well, this can happen more readily. Okay, I'm not a geologist, but I can find one. All right. And we'll have a geologist. And you say, well, they got to be a Christian geologist. I want an accurate geologist, one that's got, would be more concerned about their credentials to be Christian accurate. Yes, yes. And I know this other lady, well, she happens to be a Christian and she mentions this. And she discovered what she called soft tissue. He named it. All right. And just because they mean soft tissue in, let's say, the mind of somebody like myself that is not a paleontologist, I'm thinking like skin. You found skin. You found tendons. Well, just like the bone, it looks like a bone, but it's not, it's, a petrified bone is not, it's not the same thing as our bone. It isn't, all right? When she talks about soft tissues, it's evidence of the soft tissue that once was there. It's not soft tissue. So under a microscope, there's evidence of veins because of the microscopes that sh they were able to use. I and I'm not, and in those veins that they were able to, or she was able to, they found evidence of blood cells. And then they called this soft tissue. Not that it's skin. Not that it's tendons. And I listened to these guys on the programs. And I watched this one actually got out a piece of, and it looked like skin. And he's stretching it like this. And to an average person's mind, that wouldn't bother to go and do a little bit of background search on this. They might think that that's legit. Well, my gosh, if you can do that, then obviously this has got to be like, Less than 5,000 years old. I think that's, I don't have her on my program yet. I know that she, she felt that was very upsetting, that people would use her discovery. And I'm just going to use this nice word, shuck and jive, for right now. And when I get her on the program, David, mm -hmm. she can tell you about her discovery, not you, but the listening audience, in all fairness, get the person that made the discovery. That's what I want to do. She's going to be on the program. She's going to tell you what soft tissue is. She's going to tell us how she first found it. And from there, where did discovery lead to from, you know, from there? And these other people that are telling this kind of nonsense for sensationalism to try to prove their biblical type of agenda, you know, which I think if they're teaching, if you're trying to prove an agenda, but 
you're not honest about what you're using, that's not good. I think, what does that do to a person's faith? What does that do to somebody that really wants to believe? Here's this one person, I'm a PhD, and he's on this program or behind the pulpit, and people are looking up at that that individual thinking, the, and the elders had said okay, and the, and the pastor said okay, and there they are in the pulpit, and they're telling this kind of stuff to the congregation. And information's available to us now, folks. And if somebody wants to and they find out what well, guess what? He was at our church and and this isn't this isn't true. Okay, I'm gonna stop at that. Doesn't mean we're gonna stop the program. I'm having a pretty good time here. Unless There's David, you, you you gotta have your nap. If you gotta have your nap, we'll do it. No, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> I don't nap anymore. Uh, well the thing is I, you told me that what what did you just say if, if you wanted to go the, the the naked archaeologist, you need your you need your blood pressure medicine or something if you gotta watch yeah, that. I gotta take my blood pressure medicine before I watch those those films. They, yeah. they upset me. But I would say to, to the folks listening, um, as with everything today, everything, you need to do your own homework. Mm -hmm. Very true. You can't just accept what everybody's telling us because you know very well, I know, you know, and everybody's known the last uh Last five years, we've had a lot of misinformation uh, mm -hmm. on from every direction. I do and professionals make mistakes. What we have that various inscription that came from Tel Lakish. I think it's only like a year out, Which and they found out that it was a uh, word. Darius inscription, the Darius in the Persian, and it was okayed by the IAA. Some top archaeologists all gave it its approval. And then a professor came forward and said, ah, when I had my tour group there last year, I put that on a pot shirt to show my kid, to show my students what the language looked like on a pot shirt because we call that ostrakan or straka. And then when the class was done, she just threw it, threw it away. Well, what's wrong with that, right? You're done. And somebody was walking through the excavation to tell which tours do and they found it and voila it hits the press and everybody says this is the real deal and it wasn't so it doesn't mean that everybody is deliberately out there to it, it stuff happens stuff happens wow what's it i was going to say something about that but no <laughs> it threw it oh this is what i was looking now i you know I, i'm i'm a some people are pure nerds and Greek freaks. That's the people that study Greek and or a dead language like Latin, right? Okay, if you're into that, you're a, you're a Greek freak. You know, Teresa did that. I just said you're a Greek freak. And then, of course, I'm into pottery, so I'm a shirt nerd. <laughs> no shirt. So anyway, I was looking at the and, the, and of course, I think it has, what's the writing for the Persians back there? Aramaic? Okay, it's Aramaic. All right, and, and they said, oh, now think about it. They're so concentrating on the inscription to make sure the letters match that time period because letters change throughout the ages, just like the, the, our English. And you look at an old newspaper, you can see that the printing changes. You can read a newspaper just the way it's printed and the paper it's on. But uh, I don't want to get off the point. Well, anyway, I'm looking at a picture, you know, of this inscription, which it is an ostracon because it's on pottery. Well, she's, yeah, she's writing in Aramaic, fifth century, but the pottery is Byzantine. You can see, when you see the pottery Byzantine and Roman, you see the scribations, right, in the pottery. It's heavier. If I can show people, why, where's my pottery when I need it, people? When I'm not, because... A cooking pot. What did I do? Oh, okay. Here we go. Hang on, folks. That's a cooking pot. Here we go. Now, can you if you can't see see the striations? There you go. See them? They get thicker, thicker, thicker. That's Roman period there. Yeah. And then when you get to the Byzantine period, it's actually thicker. And you can hear that pottery makes a certain sound. It's got a certain look to it. The handles are a certain yeah. size, uh, shape. Yeah, very thin. Roman. The pottery had this gyration like this, so it, it, it looked to me like it was either 
you know, like it could have been, I'm just going to say generally because it starts to have these gyrations in the latter part of the Hellenistic period, Roman period, Byzantine. So it's a much later period, I'm going to say, than the writing that was on it. And they're so concentrating on the writing to say, well, this is, this comes from the time period of Darius. So this comes not to look at the pottery and say, well, then why is the pottery Hellenistic period? Why is the pottery Roman period? So it didn't make any sense, really. And uh, so I looked at it and I said, you know what? The thing is, I I bought into it, even though I know pottery. Why? Because they're the experts, not me. That's the IAA. They're over there. They're walking on top of this stuff every day. Who am I to say, you know, that this pottery doesn't make sense with that type of inscription on it? But then again, you know, bald guys can be right every once in a while. You know, what the heck? Yeah, that's right. It looks like this, right? Hey, we had a fun time today. At least I did. Yeah. yeah. And I hope people, you know what? I know we're going to get some grief on this. And uh, okay. So we could just do the reverse on this. If you don't agree with us, then you can laugh at us for laughing at them. And you can say, well, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know. That's fine. I don't care. Because we'll we'll do our best anyway. I'm not disparaging their their sincerity, as I said. Absolutely before. not. Absolutely not. They're uh, you know? the well-meaning Christians that wanted to uh, find support for Christians, but sometimes it it it, uh, it leads uh, to all the yeah. Got to have a Ruth Amaran around somewhere. Amaran, yeah, yeah. Ruth is good. The old go to for for pottery so yeah, you got some new research, ones out check out your sources mm -hmm. and uh um don't just take our word for it and uh i think we'd be better for it right but uh that's it you know it's gotta be careful out there folks and if it's sensational and you enjoy it but you know it's sensational then just have fun what the heck enjoy Enjoy the locations where they take you. you know? yeah. What the heck? That's if what I, I do. If I speculate on stuff, I usually tell you it's speculation rather than, you know, saying it's fact. So uh, it's fun to speculate sometimes. Uh, yep. It's okay to have fun, but uh, do your homework, folks. My final word. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it takes a little bit of time. That's... Yeah, but it's it's worth it. It's it, and really, it's a lot of fun. I would say don't have fun trying to debunk people. That's that gets old because there's all kinds of stuff like that going on in the internet anyway. And I realize that's kind of what we did, so it might seem hypocritical for me to say that. But that's kind of not what it's about. It's, you know, if, if it's if it's not right, and maybe it and it. it, it whether it was done intentionally or not, uh, if if an archaeologist knows better, then just bring it out to the people. Okay, so that wasn't Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, move on. What the heck? There's other things to do in archaeology. Lots more things to do. Yeah. Um, and the purpose so, of the program is for us just to point people in the right direction. That's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the website. Biblical Archaeology from the Ground Down, sponsored by Bible Interact. Dr. Grace, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Everybody, I really appreciate it. everybody subscribing. Get in there, ring the bell. You know what to do. And uh, thank you very much. We are closing in on 91,000 subscribers. I bet you we're going to hit it today. We were, last time I looked, we were like 90.7, something, something, something like so. Today, we'll, we'll be at 91 subscribers. 91,000. You know how I know that, David? Because these people watching the program are going to subscribe today. That's how I know. That's it. You know what to do. All right. David, thank you for your time. You're welcome. And everybody, you have a great day. And I appreciate you visiting the channel.